Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. We're here to help you introduce you to Jesus. And, and if, you, if you don't know Jesus, and if you know him, we want to make him more. We want to be more like Jesus each day. I had an opportunity to be in Labrador this week, and uh, I met some friends of mine who has been struggling with some illnesses, and, and uh, she had a stroke, and she, she was actually... She, they pronounced her dead on the table, and they looked back a few seconds later, and she's actually moving her hands. And Anyway, so she survived and, and recovered from stroke. An amazing story. Larry and I had a chance to meet with her. It was absolutely, it was, um, it was an amazing experience. Hey, Larry, you have to agree to that. One of the things she said, and I had to agree with her, I only want to be more like Jesus. That's what that's what she was saying. I want to be more like Jesus, and so this. I think that I think I know that that's the goal of every one of us here today. We want to be more like Jesus and to live like Him. And so, um, just want to welcome you here. And I'm. I, we got a couple of pieces of business I want you to be aware of. We're going to be doing a business meeting on um, July 7th. The heat pump died several years ago no we found out our heat pump is not working and so we have to replace the heat pump so we're going to need uh, approval for that is uh, we we think it's going to be way more than fifteen hundred dollars and so so we need your approval so we're going to bring the church in for um, um, just the discussion and hopefully get approval to replace our heat pump in our church so that we can have air conditioning and primarily heat I, I was thinking as I was getting up here you know We've had a great summer. Uh, now, as we prepare for fall, <laughs> no, it, it's been, it's been, you know, we had a couple of good days, right? It's, that's not bad. It's, not, it's nothing to complain about. Nothing to complain. About. It's been good. Um, Edwin, uh, Edwin did an amazing trip this. Uh, was it this week, Edmund? This uh, last week he went to. Cape Breton um, and went around the Cabot Trail. Have you ever, who's ever been around the Cabot Trail? Edwin said he had uh, downhill all the way through it. Everywhere it was downhill. <laughs> On his bike. No, he did say though he had a lot of tailwind. And he went all the way around the Cabot Trail on bike. I said, man, you got a lot of nerve. He was telling me he's going to do it and he did it. So how many of you did that? Was it just you or five people? So you got into the tailwind and they dragged you along. Is that how that? <laughs> oh, did they really? You were, you were that far behind. <laughs> he said he got lost. He had to write his road on the trail and said, we're gone this way. I don't, that's not what you meant, was it? <laughs> they did? <laughs> were they teasing you or what? Were they? For, for real. Anyway, Edwin, I, good on you to go be able to do something like that because that's a big deal to drive around a cab trail on a bike and it's not easy. It wasn't an electric bike either. No, no. See, see, he shook vigorously his head. It was not an electric bike. Um, other announcements, board nominations. Um, Stephanie is going to be, every four years we change out. A member can serve for four years and then they have to take sabbatical for a year. Stephanie's turn is off, and so what we're looking for is nominations for um, someone uh, from the congregation who you feel might be appropriate to have on our board. So I just want to uh, throw that out there, and um, yeah, and there's, there's nomination forms at the back of the church. If you want to grab one, you can put somebody's name in there and say, you know, you feel that this person would be appropriate for um, our deacon's board. So it's a four-year sentence, and so, so think carefully about it when you do it, but it, it's a four-year sentence. I've done it for a long time, and um, I've always enjoyed it. I don't, if God calls you to do something, it doesn't really feel like work, does it, really? When, when you're doing a job that God wants you to do, and I found it even in my career, God found something that he felt that I would be amazingly passionate about it, and he gave it to me, and I ran with it. And I believe every second that God wanted me to be a paramedic. And, um, and that's what I did for, for what, 30-something years, um, leading paramedics. And, and the past, I couldn't breathe unless I was a paramedic. So 
just think about what God is calling you to do, and, and, um, and if he's called you to do something, do it with your whole heart. Um, what else do I need to put here? Baptism. We're going to have baptism on July 21st. Here, it's written clearly. I can read. So can you. Um, July 21st, we're going to have baptism at King uh, uh, Stephanie, or Steph, where's it going? It's going to be at Ken and Cheryl's place. See, I could read that there too, but I didn't look. Anyways, I just want to um, remind you of that. And so the rest you can, you can read through there. When I came in this morning, I had a look at the course the pastor uh, highlights a uh, scripture verse that he wants us to read, and we'll bring it up on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. It is, it, I found it amazingly moving when I read this this morning, and if I were to tattoo something on my arm or on my forehead, this would be, this would be one of the ones I would consider as well. I mean, there's a lot in scripture that you want to say. So uh, here's what it says. I'll read it to you. You can look along, and you can I won't ask us to, you know, read it together, but I want to read it to you. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who would stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word, I put my hope. We can we can certainly all of us can agree to that, can't we? That that would be something that we would hold on to and hold dearly, say and and agree with David when he wrote that. I I would agree wholeheartedly and pat him on the back, say, Yes, I want to be like that. That's what I agree with one hundred percent. So as we talk about that now this morning, we want to go into a time of prayer, and I have...
Pastor Dan. Thank you, David, for that very spiritual prayer time. I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, you talk about um, tattooing Bible verses on your forehead. I, I, here's my proposition. I think between the two of us, we could get the full book of Romans <laughs> on our foreheads. So, You're keeping it going, aren't you? yeah, I'm going to keep it going. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture this morning that we're actually looking at downstairs with the kids. They're going to be going through the same, same thing. So I thought that was kind of neat how that worked out. And uh, we're going to, going to look at... Uh, uh, Allie, if you could put up the book of... Uh, or the passage. We're going to be reading John 3. So it says, Now there was a Pharisee a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing uh, if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, uh, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. Uh, Let's go back. How can you, uh, how can this be? Uh, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. Um, And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak uh, of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still... uh, You people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up, uh, that everyone who believes might have eternal life in him. And you all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Uh, We're going to invite the kids and the youth. They can head downstairs. Amy will uh, will be leading you this morning. Well, I want to extend a welcome to you. If you're visiting with us, if this is your first time here in church, um, here at Cornerbrook Baptist, my name is Pastor Dan. I am the associate pastor here. We're very excited to have you, uh, have you here. And uh, this is not a, a real summery day out there, is it? No, and Pastor Mitchell keeps bringing it up, how the weather's better in Nova Scotia. But... Uh, so today is a little bit of a little bit of a cooler day, a little bit windier. Um, as a kid, for a few years, I, I spent uh, when I was about six, seven, eight. I spent some time in uh, um, Clark's Beach. Anybody know where Clark's Beach is in the East Coast? Beautiful little town. But, so I, I lived in Clark's Beach, and one of the greatest joys every summer was when we would come to Embry, which is in central Newfoundland and we would visit my grandfather and my grandmother. And they lived um, right on the main street in Embry, and right across the road was this wharf. And as a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old, to have uh, a good week-long span where I could spend every day out on the wharf fishing for Connors 
and crabs and whatever else was down there was like, it was heaven. It was like being in Eden for an eight-year-old. And I would get up in the morning and I would go down at, and when the tide was low, you'd collect wrinkles. You guys know what they are? Little snails, little sea snails. And I would crack them and you'd put them on the hook. And I knew the spots around the wharf. It went out really far. And it strikes me now that like when my kids were seven, if they went out on a wharf and spent all day out there, I would be scared to death. But my parents were just like, don't fall in. Because I'm not jumping in after you. <laughs> Maybe that's what. But um, I, I would go out there and I would spend all day. And so I, there was a stage on the wharf, which is like a little hut where you keep all the fishing gear and stuff. You do. But there are a lot of people who probably don't. And um, so you walk through and I can still smell like all the salt from the fish. And it just was such a, such a good smell, and I'd walk out through that second door, I'd gone to the wharf, and I knew the little spots, right? I knew the little spots where I could fish, and I, would, uh, I knew that their crabs would hide down here, and I, I knew how many times, like, there's an art to catching crabs on a hook. You gotta let them crawl over the bait, and then you jig them three times, and you bring them up, and they're like, Ugh. that's my crab impression. <laughs> yeah, see? And uh, Connors, and, and when the tide was high, you'd catch tomcods, and, and it was just like heaven for an eight-year-old boy. And so um, uh, I would, uh, I was down there one day, and I was, I looked up the road, and there was this kid coming on his bike. And he, he, he came, and he, he pedaled up, pedaled right fast, and stopped by the wharf. And then he, he walked out on the wharf and stood there and stared at me while I was fishing. He was about my age. He stood there and he went, Buddy, where's you from? I said, uh, from Clark's Beach. And he went, oh yeah. And he stared at me for another little while and then he asked me a question that I'll never forget. He looked at me and went, is you saved? <laughs> That's what he asked me. And so in my little eight-year-old mind, I was thinking, what do I say? If I, if I say yes, is he going to make fun of me? Is it going to be, is it going to, but if I say no, I'm going to feel guilty. I'd be like, I just knew that as soon as I said no, there would be a rooster crowing somewhere and I'd feel off. <laughs> and I just thought about it. What do I do? What do I do? What do I say to this guy? I don't know him. He's asking if I'm saved. Is, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And I went, uh, yep. Yeah. That's how I answered. And he went, Oh, yeah. Got on his bike and rode away. <laughs> and in my mind, I went, wow, I stood up for Jesus. <laughs> Next step is martyrdom, maybe. <laughs> but I, uh, in that moment, I, I, he asked if I was saved. I was confronted with the, the question, am I saved? And I said yes. And he, I guess he was too, because he just went, yeah, okay. Rode away. Um, there was another, uh, I heard a story about a, a young, uh, or not a young person, but a, a president of a, a seminary. And he went into a store around Christmas time, and there was a Salvation Army kettle there. And the person who was, uh, uh, who was working at the kettle and taking donations, he was, he, as he walked by this, this uh, uh, older lady who was, who was taking donations, she said, Sir, excuse me. And he turned around and looked at her and said, uh, and she said, are you saved? And he went, well, yes. And she said, no, no, you don't, don't understand. Are you, uh, have you given your life fully over to Jesus? Do you trust him in everything? Is he Lord of your life? Has he forgiven your sins? And she, um, he said, he said, ma'am, I, I don't think you realize who I am. He said, I'm the president of a, uh, very renowned theological seminary. I, I, I'm a professor of theology and uh, I'm president of, of, of a, a seminary. He said, uh, and she said, Sir, doesn't matter where you've been or who you are, he can even save you. <laughs> and he walked away thinking, that's a weird, that's apparently a true story. But here's the thing there's another story in the book of, uh, a book of John. 
chapter 3. And it's a very interesting story, and it's one of the stories where we actually get a lot of our theology surrounding salvation. And uh, we, we pull out a lot of things. And in this story is actually one of the most famous Bible verses ever. We read it. John 3.16. You can say it with me. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a verse that uh, I would venture that uh, even in a, maybe even especially the older generations... If you ask them what John 3.16 was, they would probably know it. It's a, it's a very familiar verse. And, and, but here's, here's an interesting thing that happens. In the book of John, chapter 3, Jesus, uh, at night, a man comes to him named Nicodemus. Let me find it here so we can, so we can read it. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. I, I'm not exactly sure why he came to Jesus at night. There's a couple theories. One of them could be that Jesus was so busy during the day that after everything had happened and after everything had settled down and the crowds had gone home, that Nicodemus comes and uh, wants to have an extended conversation with Jesus. And he knows that during the day he can't do that. There's also the possibility that where, where Nicodemus is a member of the Pharisees and a member of the ruling council, he doesn't want anyone to see him talk to Jesus, right? And he's got some questions, and he comes to Jesus, and you can tell that there's an admiration because he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. There's something stirring in Nicodemus's heart. There's something there. He's looking at Jesus and he's curious. He's, he's looking at Jesus and he's saying, uh, he's saying there's signs and the wonders that Jesus is doing. Uh, it has to be from God because there's, there's no other way. These things uh, that he's doing, giving sight to the blind, raising the dead, healing people, uh, it, those things... I, I can't explain it. They must be from God. There was something within Nicodemus that was stirring, and Nicodemus was curious. Right? And it's not like the other Pharisees who were tra trailing around Jesus. They were chasing him around, trying to get him to trip up or trying to disprove who he was. This is Nicodemus coming and saying, I know who you are. I'm in on this secret. We know you're from God because of the signs and the wonders. And then Jesus, instead of going, well, thank you. Well, you're, you're very perceptive. Jesus flips it. Jesus knows Nicodemus' heart, and he flips it. Verse 3, he says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, that's what... See, Jesus, throughout his ministry, one of the themes of Jesus' uh, teaching and preaching and his procl proclamation was the kingdom of God. Jesus was proclaiming the rule and the reign of God both in the hearts of, of, of people, both here on earth and in the age to come throughout eternity. Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom of God. And here Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, you're not going to be able to see the kingdom that I am proclaiming unless you are born again. Now, in the Greek, it could possibly mean uh, born again could actually be translated born from above. Right? This, this sense of uh, born from, uh, uh, from heaven, born from above... And in a lot of our verses, it's, or in a lot of our, our translations, it's interpreted as, uh, it's translated as born again. And I like that translation because in the very next verse, Nicodemus says, well, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Right? There's Nicodemus. Jesus is a master at saying something and the, the people who are listening, he, he says just the right thing to make them go, what? And then ask a question and, 
dig a little bit deeper. Jesus is very good at kind of throwing breadcrumbs and getting you to walk towards him just out of curiosity and saying, what are you, what are you talking about? I need to know more about this. And so that's what Jesus does here. He says, unless you are born again. And Nicodemus, he goes, but how is that possible? Can I, can I get in my mother's womb and, and be born a second time? And here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Again, this is a phrase that's a little bit hard to know exactly what Jesus was saying. But any of the translations or any of the interpretations of this it doesn't change the meaning, right? Uh, some would say, like for instance, in, uh, in Titus 3.5, um, the author talks about uh, a washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Talks about, uh, and also in, uh, uh, in Ephesians 5, there's a passage where, uh, where Paul is talking about to husbands, and he's talking about how husbands deal with their wives and, and, and relate to their wives, and he says, uh, he uses the phrase, uh, washed... Uh, washing of water through the word. So when Jesus says, uh, unless you're born of water and spirit, what he could be saying here is this cleansing, unless you are cleansed uh, by the spirit, unless you're purified and, and, the, and the, the spirit gives you new life, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Also could just simply mean born of water, be natural birth. Okay? It could mean that. And either way, it doesn't really change, uh, change the meaning. And here's why. It says, uh, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. And verse 8, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You see, what, what Jesus is saying here is, okay, so... We think about biology right now in 2024. We think of uh, this idea that when something gives birth to something else, that naturally there's a lineage. There's a, um, uh, the, the thing that's born is going to be uh, the same as what gave birth to it. What I mean is butterflies don't give birth to buffalo. Right? That's a pretty common sense thing in 2024. But back then, this was something that they were really, this biological law, they were really trying to figure it out and understand why is it that um, when someone gives, or someone or something gives birth, that the essence of what they are is, is passed on uh, down the line. Why don't buffalo give birth to butterflies? Why not? And it was even a philosophical question. Why is it that... Um, why is it that, uh, you know, uh, parents can, can give birth and, uh, to a child and that child uh, resembles the parents? Why, why is that? What's the, what's the philosophical uh, reason behind that? It was, it was a major topic. And Jesus addresses that. Jesus says, uh, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. It's something that they were, uh, it was actually a topic of, of scientific discussion. What makes something what it is? That's the question. What makes something what it is? You were naturally born. Uh, you were born naturally and flesh resulted in flesh. But here's the thing. Jesus is saying there's something else. So if you are born of water and the spirit, you're born naturally and born spiritually. Jesus is saying, if you are born uh, of flesh, then you will be flesh. Also, if you are also born of the Spirit, uh, the Spirit gives birth to Spirit, right? The life that the Spirit gives um, is what Jesus is talking about. God's Spirit gives you spiritual life. This is not a divine nature, 
We don't become little gods, but God is saying that there is an opportunity for you to have a new spiritual life. And then Jesus, in the very next verse, he says this. He says, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. You see, at some point in my young life, before I was on the wharf, there was, must have been a time where at some point I looked at my sinful life. <laughs> I don't know, probably not. But I realized that, that Jesus wanted a relationship with me, and I surrendered my life to him. As a teenager, I will admit to you that I walked away from that. I didn't want anything to do with it. And for a period in my teen years, I, I walked away. And then one afternoon, or one evening, God got a hold of me again. And I surrendered my life to Jesus. And what, what Jesus is saying here is that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility, not for our own salvation, but we have a responsibility to accept the spiritual life that Christ wants to give us. Jesus says you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God wants to give each and every one of us brand new life. And that's what he's saying to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is coming from a tradition that, that the more you work, the more you do, the better you are, the more likely you will be to gain favor with God. And what Jesus is saying is that you can have a brand new life. There's a verse that says, the old is gone, the new has come. And that's what happens when we give our lives to Jesus Christ. And so, Bible says in 1 Corinthians, let's read this. If you've got your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 6.19. First Corinthians 6.19 says this, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Did you read that? Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.11. I want to, let's turn back to that. Romans 8.11 says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Now, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he throws this at him. And this, like I said earlier, this is where we get some of our, uh, our um, terminology about salvation. This is where we get some of our uh, theology. But Jesus says, uh, he tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. But here's the beautiful part of this. We can be born naturally, but when we're also born supernaturally, here, we are given brand new life in the Spirit. We have access to the throne room of God, right? We have the Spirit coming to live within us. We have a relationship with the creator of the universe. And when you start a spiritual life, when you surrender your life to Christ, you are his child and he is your father. All that you've done is forgiven because of his sacrifice for you on the cross. Let's go back to John. John 3. And we're going to read that passage that you know so well. We're going to read that verse. It says, For God loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world 
through him. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Jesus says he is the light. I had a weird thing happen last Sunday night. I'll tell you about it. Um, Max and I, we said uh, it was getting a little late in the evening. It was about 7 o'clock. And uh, I said to Max, I said, do you want to go fishing? Max said, sure. So we loaded up our little Prius with a kayak and our fishing gear. and We uh, went to our little fishing hole that we have. Now, this fishing hole is seven kilometers in the woods. We drove in there. It's about 7K. And we got in there, and as we're pulling up to where we go fishing, there's a little bridge that you have to pass over. And um, one of the rocks on the trail, we quickly realized once we hit the bridge, one of the rocks on the, on the woods road we were driving up had punctured our tire. So we get in there, and it's like, no sweat, we'll just change the tire. Well, a Toyota Prius is not really made for a uh, woods road. And they don't come with spare tires. They come with a tire repair kit. That's for if you get a little pinprick in your tire. This was a gash about that long. And so it didn't, didn't work. And so it's getting to be about, uh, by the time we're in there and by the time we realize and we're getting things ready, uh, it's, it's like... 8.30, pushing 9 o'clock, and we're like, man, we didn't even get to fish. How are we going to get out? We just said, we'll just call somebody. No cell service. <laughs> <laughs> Fun times. We're seven kilometers in the woods. Nobody around. What do we do? So uh, we tried the, uh, after we tried repairing the, the tire and all that, it was, you could see that the, the, the sun was starting to go down. Like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. So we... Uh, we took the kayak off the top of the, of the Prius and we stowed it in the woods and we locked up the car and we said, well, I guess we're going to have to walk. So we started to walk. About kilometer five, it was getting pretty dark. And then very quickly, it got black. Now, if you know Max, my son Max, he's um, always prepared. Always. There's, he, we, when we go fishing, I grab my tackle box and I grab a rod and I get in the car. Max goes and he grabs two, two backpacks and he's got those preloaded with survival gear and all kinds of stuff. And I, in my mind, I'm always thinking, we're never going to need that. We're just going in for a, an hour on the lake. And he, uh, so he's got, his, he's got his backpack and it gets dark and he goes, just a second. He reaches in and he pulls out a headlamp, puts it on. You know what that did? It went from us walking in complete darkness. All of a sudden, there's a light. We know where we're going. We know where we're stepping. We're not going to twist an ankle on a rock because Max had a light. Jesus is the light, isn't he? This world, this darkness, everything that you experience, uh, Jesus is is the light. He's the headlamp on Max's hat. So you can see where you're going. You can see what you need to do. You, can, you know you're not going to fall into the ditch. Jesus is the light that came into this dark world. And he is the light for you. You know, in a lot of... One of the things that I, has, has struck me is that sometimes, not always... But there are times that people come to this church from other churches that don't emphasize the need to be born again. They don't emphasize the need to, to, to know Jesus, have a personal relationship with Him. And that struck me over the past little while, that someone could come to our church and not be confronted with the idea that Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. He wants to save you. He wants to give you a new spiritual Life. He wants to come and put his spirit within you. He wants to have a relationship. He wants to forgive you and give you a brand new existence. And I'm here to tell you this morning that if you're here and you don't know Jesus, he is the light. And he's calling you 
He's calling you to make that step and to make that decision. See, here's the cool thing about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was searching. I know there are people in this church who are searching. I know there are people who are like Zacchaeus, who are up in the tree looking at Jesus. But I'm looking, Jesus sees you up there, and Jesus is looking up and going, it is time for you to make a decision for me. It is time for you to be born again. It is time for you to allow me to forgive you and give you a brand new spiritual life. We talk about it sometimes as inviting Jesus into our hearts. That conversation with Nicodemus had a profound impact on him. How do I know? I want to read you this. Uh, this is a very cool, um, this is a very interesting story. Look at, Nicodemus pops up a couple more times in the book of John. Look at John 7. The Pharisees are wondering what to do with Jesus. And uh, they're, they're, they're plotting to kill him. And verse, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 45 says, Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Oh, by the way, we made it out of the woods. I didn't finish the story. We made it out okay, don't worry. We got to the six-kilometer mark, and someone drove by and picked us up and drove us the other kilometer. We're like, thanks. It's great. But anyway, uh, sorry, he says, uh, why didn't you bring him in? Verse 46, no one ever spoke this way, the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? As if to say, none of us leaders believe in this, this joker, this fake. No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. What he's saying is he's, he's deceived all the people, but all the, none of us believe in him. And so Jesus, uh, or Nicodemus in verse 5, Nicodemus who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, <laughs> asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? Nicodemus was the voice of reason because he was believing in Jesus. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Nicodemus stands up for Jesus. There's also one other time that Nicodemus is mentioned. And it's in chapter 19. After Jesus is crucified, after it all went down, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea... And it says in there, the same Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night took Jesus' body. Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of myrrh mixed with aloe, and him and Joseph of Arimathea prepared Jesus' body to be buried. Nicodemus followed Jesus. Though he was a Pharisee, Nicodemus was changed by Jesus. We have good reason to believe that Nicodemus was born of the Spirit. He was born again. I want to end by saying this. If you're here today and you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, if you're here this morning and you need to be reborn, you've been born naturally, but there's the option of being born of the Spirit, you can be forgiven today. You can start a brand new life today in the Spirit. I want to give you that opportunity. I will be here. Pastor Mitchell will be here. We would love, or we have got other leaders like Dave are here. We would love to pray with you. We would love to lead you to Jesus today. We would love to help you accept Christ as your Savior uh, if, that is, if that's what you want to do. Jesus today is saying you must be born again. He's given you the invitation. He's the light. He can give you a brand new life. Don't wait. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. Lord, thank you today. This is a message that is, uh, Lord, in a lot of ways we have been like Nicodemus where we've been interested and we've come and we've... Uh, done our research or we've watched from afar and you have said 
you must be born again. Many of us here have responded and we've accepted that new life that you bring, that, that new relationship, that forgiveness. But Lord, sometimes we can look and we can watch and we can observe and never make that step. And so Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who has not accepted the new life, the new spiritual life that you offer, I pray that you would do that. You would help them today and uh, give us an opportunity to pray with them and, and lead them to you. Lord, we love you. In your name, amen. Please, please stand with us.
the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him Cause who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Thank you, Pastor Dan. Yeah. You know, there's, uh, mentioned this, remember looking at John 3 a few years ago, there's a technical discussion over whether it was Jesus who spoke the words in verses 16 to 21. And there are some who feel that that is actually John's theological reflections of the story of Nicodemus. Now, Either way, it doesn't change the, the meaning or the message of it. But just think about that. If that is John's reflection, what's his first reflection on the whole story of Nicodemus? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. What an amazing deduction from the interaction with Nicodemus. So I want to leave you with this in Romans chapter 8. We talk about a new life, and Paul wrote this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Amen.